The search conditions were, were horrible. We were facing 100 mile an hour winds, 40 foot seas, less than a mile visibility. So we really couldn't get a good picture, a good idea of what was out there. Yesterday was the first day where we really had favorable search conditions. Uh, and we took advantage of that. We had multiple uh, long range aircraft out there, including Coast Guard C 130s, an Air Force C 130, and a Navy P 8 aircraft. And I want to just uh, focus on the Navy P 8 aircraft. That's a uh, pretty sophisticated aircraft. We flew it very high, up at 27,000 feet altitude, so we could scan a very wide area. We covered 70,000 square nautical miles uh, yesterday looking for the El Faro. So, based on all of that, uh, for our search planning efforts, we are assuming that the vessel has sank. Uh, we believe it sank in, in the last known position that we recorded on Thursday. So, what that means though, we just change our search planning efforts. We are still looking for survivors or any signs of life, any signs of that vessel. Uh, we are still doing that. So the search for survivors continues. Yesterday, because of those favorable search conditions, we were able to see a lot of uh, material that was at sea. A lot of things that came from a container ship uh, of that size. So we know we recovered the El Faro's life ring. We also recovered a lifeboat that had the markings of El Faro on it. It was heavily damaged, um, but it was recovered, no signs of life there. As we went through the day yesterday, we had multiple reports of immersion suits, survival suits that were floating in the water, life rafts, and life boats. We had to check each one. We did that methodically because we wanted to make sure there were no signs of life. They were hoping to find a survivor, so we needed to check every one. In one of the survival suits, uh, we did identify human remains in one of the survival suits. Uh, we lowered a rescue swimmer to confirm uh, that the person was deceased and it was basically unidentifiable. We needed to move from there quickly because there were other reports of survival suits as well as lifeboats and life rafts. And we checked those methodically through the day. No other signs of life at this time. So as I mentioned, we are not looking for the vessel any longer. However, today we are still out there searching. We've modified our search efforts to focus more on potential people in the water, lifeboats, and life rafts. So we've kind of brought in that area. There are two uh, primary areas of concern that we're looking at. One debris field, it's about 300 square nautical miles, is in the vicinity of the last known position of the vessel. There's another debris field that's about 60 miles to the north of that one. That's a little bit smaller, it's about 70 square nautical miles. We are searching both of those. We have three Coast Guard cutters on scene. There are three commercial tugs that were hired by the shipping company. And we have a full uh, schedule of aircraft that are flying all day today. But again, we're going to fly them much lower and focused in on smaller objects at sea. So that, that is our plan moving forward. Uh, we are remain hopeful that we will try. We will hopefully find survivors. That is our focus as we move forward. Be glad to take a few questions. So th there were two lifeboats that were on the uh, the El Faro. They could each hold about 43 people. The one we found had no signs of anyone being in it. What we have to assume as search planners is if the vessel did sink on Thursday and that crew was able to abandon ship they would have been abandoning ship into a category four hurricane. So you're talking up to 140 mile an hour winds, seas upwards of 50 feet, visibility basically at zero. Those are challenging conditions um, to survive in. What do these life suits consist of? How do they help somebody in conditions like this? They're, these survival suits are, are uh, they can float, so they keep you uh, upright. Um, so you can, and they also try to hold off hypothermia so you can stay warmer a little longer. Because even in warm weather conditions, you're susceptible to hypothermia. And there's only so long you can survive in the ocean. Are there any kind of GPS beacons on those suits or on the lifeboats themselves? That we, that we don't know. How many were reported? How many survival suits were reported do you know of might be out there? They, the ship had a total of 46 uh, survival suits on board. 
Um, we, we've only been be able to locate less than a handful. So, so. so, again, in search and rescue, there's, there's an art and a science to it. The science is really just physiologically, how long can you survive in the water? In, in warm water conditions, that's, that's about four to five days. Then you kind of look at the art of it as, you know, these are trained mariners. You know, they, they know how to properly abandon ship. They, they know how to survive in the water. So we take that into account as well. But we also have to look at the conditions I talked about before. If they were able to abandon ship, it would have been in very challenging conditions, a Category 4 level storm where they might have been in a life raft or even just in the water directly. I, you know, I, I can't speculate as to that, but we're, we're not going to discount uh, somebody's will to survive, and that's why we're still searching today. The remains that you did find, were they in the stores, or were they left in No, we were not able to recover those remains. Our focus is on survivors. So we lowered a rescue swimmer into the water. Uh, that person confirmed that the, the body was deceased. It was unidentifiable. So we needed to quickly move to other reports of life. And the reason we have to do that is... The ocean is not a static being. It's alive, it's dynamic, it's constantly moving. So when we have reports of other life rafts, life boats, uh, we need to get out there and quickly identify them, see if there's any signs of life. Because if we don't do that right away, then it could sink, it could disappear, we might not be able to relocate it. So again, our focus is on survivors. That's our mission. Can we continue searching throughout the We will. We'll have uh, aircraft throughout the day. Those three Coast Guard ships, as well as the three commercial ships, will remain out overnight. They were out last night as well, continually searching. Was there any kind of warning that went out letting the crew know that they shouldn't be there, they shouldn't turn around? We, you know, it was, it was posted on the National Hurricane uh, Center's website that there was a tropical depression forming on Tuesday. Uh, on Wednesday, we all know it developed into a hurricane. Uh, I don't know what the master was thinking or what his company had told him. But all we know is they left on Tuesday. They were supposed to arrive. They left Jacksonville on Tuesday. They were supposed to arrive in San Juan, Puerto Rico on Friday. There will, you know, again, my focus now is on the search and rescue aspect of it. There will be an investigation uh, going forward. The National Transportation Safety Board will lead that investigation. The Coast Guard will be a part of that and will probably also conduct a separate uh, investigation. That's, that's down the road. My focus right now is, is on the search and rescue efforts. You concluded that the ship has sank. Um, and you mentioned last week that the ship had lost power, had reported losing the pulse. And what, right. what happens in the, that kind of sea state? Yeah. 50 foot waves, I think right. you said. Right. What happens? So, the, the worst spot for any ship to be in is when you're disabled, you lost all propulsion, you have no means to, to move that vessel you become very susceptible. You fall into the trough, basically between the waves. So you fall beam to the waves, so everything's hitting you from the side. All right, so you're looking at 140 mile hour winds, 50 foot seas hitting you from the side. The vessel we know is carrying 391 containers. So it had a lot of topside uh, height to it where the winds and the waves could hit it. it had 294 trailers and uh, automobiles below deck. So it was, it was heavy, it was weighted down. We also know that the vessel had a list to it, meaning it was leaning over about 15 degrees uh, because they had some water intrusion earlier. That just increases the danger of the situation that they were in to, to, to be able to survive that type of condition. What are the ocean depths in this area and the currents? Are they, yeah. are they pushing north? Yeah. The depth where we uh, believe the vessel sank is 15,000 feet, so, so very deep. Uh, right now, based on our search planning efforts, uh, we, we, we think the vessel uh, or survivors could potentially drift to the north. And that's why I described those debris fields. You know, one is near the last known position, but another one is 60 miles to the north of that. And that, that validates, when we find all these things, it validates our search efforts, and we can really hone in on where survivors might be. I, I don't know at that time, at this time. You know, we, we always advise mariners uh, before storms come through an area. We, we actually launched aircraft from right here at Air Station Miami, uh, went out and, um, 
and did call outs, basically warning mariners throughout the Bahamas that a, that a storm was building and that there were dangerous conditions out there. Um, so, so we always do that, and it's dangerous. When you're, anytime you're at sea, it's an, it can be an unforgiving environment, and when you add storm elements, like a category form storm to it, it just increases the danger level. We have time for one more, one more question. I, I didn't catch the question. That was the ship captain's decision to make. Thanks, Thank folks. You. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thanks.